worship with us. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, You guys can have a seat. Sweet the sound that saved the wretched 
They're not done with that song yet. But we're going to watch a drama uh, in the middle of this song. But to introduce the drama, I want to just read something to you that Paul wrote. We're in the book of Romans right now, and we'll cover this passage in probably four or five weeks. But I want to mention this Romans passage to you, Romans 3.23. And Paul says this to the church in Rome. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, when I read that, uh, it sounds like all of sin we fall short. Like, you know, here's God, and like we're here. And Christians, we can really be the most guilty of that because we at times can think we're Jesus Jr., right? That we're just almost bumping right up against that moral high code. But without giving away too much of Romans, the reality of it is we're not even close to the glory of God. It's like the, God's glory is the moon and we're on the earth. We fall short because we've sinned that much. But there's a reason that we, in our own mind, think we're better than we are. We use a different benchmark. This drama will kind of show you why I think most of us think that our moral score is a lot higher than it is. Sick, so I decided to come home for the weekend and visit my mom. Oh, your mom. I haven't seen her in so long. It's like we have lived the last year in a closet, for real. How I know. She? She's really good. She's been baking a lot. Well, that is not a bad thing. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> How's school going? It's going pretty good. Looks like you're doing your homework. Yeah, um, I'm kind of struggling with it, honestly. I have this assignment for my sociology class, and I have to rate myself on how good I think I am. Well, that should not be hard. You are a good person. I don't know. It's just, I'm really struggling. I don't know. Well, can I help you? Do they give you an example or criteria at all? Yeah, so up? basically we have a scale of 1 to 10, and it gives an example of, like, how good of a dancer you are. So a 1 would be someone who literally has two left feet, <laughs> and a 10 would be the person who leads all the line dances. Not me. Oh, uh, well, that's <laughs> good. So 1 to 10, well, where do you think you fall then? I don't know. I mean, I know I'm not a one because I feel like a one would be someone like Hitler or Bin Laden, you know, like a mass murderer type, and I'm definitely not that. No. Okay, so not a one. That's the worst. So a five? I don't know. I feel like a five would be someone who's not a mass murderer but still does some seriously bad stuff, like selling drugs to kids or abuse or shooting someone, and I'm not like them either. No. For sure. So, okay. I see how you're going up a little bit. So, maybe 7, 
That's what I thought, but I don't know. Then I considered people that, you know, maybe drink too much or are loudmouth or leave their barking dog out really late at night <laughs> or early in the morning. Just, you know, rude and inconsiderate. Like a Cubs fan? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Got that. Okay, so not a seven. I, I mean, I don't know. What do you think then? I don't know. I, I think maybe I'm about a nine. I mean, I call and talk to my mom at least once a week. Um, I give to St. Jude, the American Heart Association, and I take all my old clothes to Goodwill. Um, I belong to a local church, and I always put something in the offering plate. Um, I've never been arrested, and I've only ever had one speeding ticket. To be fair, I was going 55 in a 40 mile per hour speed trap, and it really wasn't even my fault. It was kind of ridiculous. <laughs> but I don't know. I treat my dogs like royalty. And I feel like I'm pretty courteous. I mean, I never smoke or use profanity. And I always, and I do mean always, return my shopping cart to the cart corral. <laughs> so I don't know. That gets me to think maybe I'm about a nine. I know I can't be higher than my grandma because she's definitely a 9.5. She was so good. What? Not perfect, but almost. <laughs> so I don't know. That's kind of how I feel. What about you? Where would you rank yourself? Gosh. I don't know. This is hard. Yeah. I'm definitely not like your grandma. <laughs> I do use a little profanity, but only in extreme cases. So I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure. You're not. You're really probably a 9.2. I'd have to say I'm maybe an 8.5. You're higher than that. <laughs> I don't know. It. I'm just not sure. But what I am sure of, you are going to get a good grade on this paper. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I have to run. Good luck. Tell your mom I said hello. I will. Okay? It's so it was good to see good you. To see you. Take care. You too. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> That hit, that hit home with anybody? If that's how you, you look at yourself, you compare them to, you go to the who's a zero, then a five, then a seven. It, except the, the problem with that is, is the benchmark isn't uh, Hitler. It's not uh, your next neighbor with the barking dog. The benchmark, God's benchmark, is him. And he's perfect. Never a sin in deed, never a sin in thought, perfection. And none of us are even close to that. So if God's the benchmark, then none of us even get on the scale of one. That's the reality. And your walk to Christ, your walk of faith is to learn that and understand that, that God sees us that way and yet loves us so much that he brought us this thing called grace, undeserved favor. And he came in the form of Jesus Christ and our trust in him. And that's why the more you know God, the deeper your faith is, the more you know how heavy your sin is the more you know how you fall short of God, and yet you also know how much God loves you. For yet while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says this. Paul writing to the church, Christians in Ephesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, your faith in Jesus. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Not by works. That's not how we are restored to God. That's not how we get to heaven. That's not how our relationship with God is mended. It's through trusting in Jesus Christ and his grace. So let's stand and let's sing full voice at the end of the song.
Father God, we are just so grateful for your amazing grace. And God, we are grateful that you meet us right where we are. That you take us as broken vessels, God, and you pour in your love and your grace and your mercy. And through your death and resurrection, God, as broken vessels, we are raised to life. God, and we just want to thank you and we want to praise you for that amazing grace and amazing love. God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Romans. We thank you that it teaches us that though we fall short, God, because of you, because of you, we can walk in this life with confidence and peace and love for each other and a hope of eternal life with you, God. Father, I just pray that you would be with Pastor Tom as he brings the word. Speak to our hearts. Teach us, God. Draw us closer to you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Awesome. You guys go take a seat. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Before Tom comes up, I just want to give a few announcements. One, if you're visiting with us today, we are, we are so glad that you're here, and we, we are excited to be back at it, and hopefully you are all thawing out from the weather this week. Are, are you guys not just totally pumped for, like, is it Tuesday or Wednesday where it's, like, close to 60 degrees? And Yeah, so... It's amazing. I, I love it. You know, you look out, and now it's 5.30, 5.45, and it's getting lighter. We're getting close to, to spring, and it just uh, it does a lot for your soul and just feels good. Wintertime is good to kind of you know, just kind of relax and, and maybe dwell upon some things, but it's good to get back at it and, and uh, just life abounds and looking forward to the springtime. So, but if you are visiting with us today, we'd love to know that you're here. We'd love for you to go out to the information table um, or you can go into the connect room, which is the room right across the hallway. And they've got a little visitor packet that they'd love to give you. And, and then again, if you, if you get that and go into the connect room, they'll give you a free t-shirt and you can ask all kinds of questions and, and ask why we do what we do and see what ministries are available and all those things, but we'd, we'd love for you just to, to stop in and do that. And then also, um, if you're visiting, you'll see that we don't take communion together as a group in here um, on a regular basis, but we do have a room behind this wall. You go through the bookstore and called the Reflection Room, and you can go in there and, and you're able to just pray. You're able to write out prayer requests. People will pray for you if you want that, and you can take communion on your own and remember why we're here. Um, and what Tom talked about, just the amazing grace that God has given us and, and through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. So we'd love for you to do that, take advantage of that. And then also we don't take an offering during the service. So if you're here today as a guest, just sit back, enjoy the service. Hopefully you connect with God. But if Oak Bridge is your home, you guys know where the joy boxes are at. And there's just one requirement that you have to give with a smile on your face because you've got to believe in the mission, the mission of the church, which is to make followers of Jesus Christ who go out and turn make followers of Jesus Christ. So um, th those are some things for the new people. Then uh, for those Oak Bridgers here, if you've got a middle schooler, 7th through 12th grade, middle schooler, high schooler, tonight, no weather cancellations. No, uh, we're getting back into it at 6 o'clock. We've got the edge service for those, for those students, and I would encourage you to bring them up. You can stay as well for the first hour. They have a worship service and some games and things in here, and then for the last hour or so, they break up into small groups, talk about the messages and just what's going on in their life. So take advantage of that. Then also... Tom wanted me to mention that in the bookstore, we've got a few different books that are on sale, um, you know, that you can read up your spiritual walk with Christ. One is called Today's Moment of Truth. These are devotions by a guy named Lee Strobel. Um, he wrote Case for Christ. So I, I love this book. It's actually the one that I picked, and, and it just has a lot of a lot of reasons why we believe what we believe. You know, our faith is not about jumping off of a ledge and just hoping that, that what we believe is out there, but it's actually based upon real events and there's evidence behind the reasons why we believe what we believe. And I think that's regularly 20 bucks on sale for 10. Tom's Choice needed a little bit bigger discount for whatever. And his is called The Reason for God and The Prodigal God. Actually, two great books in one. From, uh, from Tim Keller. And so his is regularly 30 on sale for 10. Um, so 30 on sale for 10. How many books is it? It's two books in one. On sale for what? They heard me. 10? Yeah, uh-huh. But we can't hear you. Uh, yeah. There. I could there buy one book 
for $10, that's ready to $20, or I could buy two books, that's ready to $30 for $10. They're a smart group, you know which one to buy. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then we've got another one that neither one of us picked, we're just putting this out there. You know, Lent started this past week, and again, a great time just to, to draw closer to Christ and in anticipation of the celebration that we'll have on Easter and, and looking forward to that. But So we're a couple days behind, but there's a 40-day experience here just called Life Is, just a devotional that can help lead you, and it just talks about God's Illogical love is what it says. It makes no sense but that the God of the universe would care so much about us. That's a great book by a pastor named Judas Smith that a lot of you know. But what's crazy about the book is it's really $15, right? Yep. So we thought we'd do something nuts. Have books helped your faith grow? Immensely. Like crazy. Like you tell me, you, 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 you read a lot of books. I do. I mean, I know that. And, I, and I, it's just helped my faith grow. That's why we have the bookstore to help your faith grow. That book's 15 bucks. We thought, let's do something nuts. Let's mark it down to, I do my salesmanship. $7? No. Six? You, we're not going to rip you off six? No. Five? No. These are the uncomfortable moments for me, just <laughs> so you all know. <laughs> Four? Uh -huh. No. Three bucks. That book is $3 uh -huh. in the bookstore, all right? Yeah, and so we got it because we want you to read them. All right. You hate that, don't you? No, I just fine. They're just... <laughs> They hate it. <laughs> well, let's, let's just say that. So. Go ahead and pray. All right. Actually, what I want to do is just give you guys a moment. You know, just go to God. And, and the amazing thing is maybe you haven't spoken to him in a while. And maybe you're going through some tough times and you think, wow, I only turn to God when, when it's really getting rough. You know, the amazing thing about grace is, is, is we should stay connected with God all the time. But, you know, he doesn't just boot us and say, oh, you haven't spoken to me in a week, so forget you. Not going to listen today. As a matter of fact, what he says is come. When you're burdened, come. No matter what's on your heart, go to God right now. Take it to him in prayer. Father in heaven, um, we just we come to you and, and we can have confidence in the fact that because of the work of Christ on our behalf that, that we can go to you and, and, and boldly, knowing that, that, that you're listening, knowing that you hear. And, and Father, I, I, had a, I had someone send me just the scripture this week and just saying that they were thinking about me, but just to, to be still and know that you're God. And so often, Father, we get so fast-paced we get so caught up in our day-to-day -day worries and problems that we forget that you're the sustainer, that you give us our daily bread, that you tell us to trust you, not to look and to worry so much about the future, but to stay in the moment and that your grace is sufficient. And Father, I don't know how you do all these things. I don't know how you create this and, and keep it going and, and hear all of our prayers and, and how you, you still have your will done even when we make crummy choices and when our sin factor is high. But Father, you are God and I'm not. And I don't have to figure it out, but I can trust you and I can remember what you have done on my behalf, sending your son, Jesus Christ, who took a punishment that we can't even begin to imagine and did it out of love. And Father, did not stay dead, but rose from the grave three days later. We celebrate that today. We look forward to the day that Jesus comes back. And we just thank you for your amazing grace. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, again, good morning. Everybody love seeing you again. My name is Tom Nobbitt. I'm one of the pastors here at Oak Bridge and love seeing everybody at Obel. And we're in week three of this uh, series called Romans. And I want to tell you up front, now it's going to start to get dicey this week and next week, really, really dicey. And it's a PG-13, so if you've got a young kid in here that you think you don't want him to hear some dicey stuff, uh, I fully understand walking them out of here because this, is, uh, this week and next week are going to be those two weeks. And um, I think it's stuff that's worth knowing at whatever age, but it may be a little bit above uh, sometimes where they're at. Anyway, week three, if you've missed the first Two weeks ago to oakbridgecc.com, oakbridgecc.org, and you can catch up there online. Last week, we talked about a couple things. One was called a truth suppressor or a truth denier. And it, 
the argument was that God's made himself known to everybody through creation, through what's been seen and what's not been seen, through emotions, values, mysteries of life, that almost every uh, group of people recognize that there is a God and uh, to not recognize that God says, I put that in their heart. So if you say, well, there is no God, then you're really suppressing truth or you're denying it. You really have to go to that, to that degree. And we talked about that being the general revelation of God, that almost every area you go to on planet Earth, they, they worship a God, a form of God. It's just, it's just inherent in people. And then we talked about that, uh, so people are without excuse, right? Would we all agree that we're without excuse? That people know that there's a God. Now, that's general revelation. Now, we'll eventually get into Romans specific revelation, which is about Jesus, but general revelation right now that there's a God, so without excuse. Then the second thing we mentioned last week is that people need to acknowledge God, that it's rude not to acknowledge somebody that you love or care about. If you walked into your house and your family didn't acknowledge you, ever acknowledge you, that would be rude and wouldn't be right. And so we mentioned that you need to acknowledge God, you need to bow down to God, this God. Sooner or later, every knee will bow, whether it's here freely and willingly, or whether it's uh, forced upon you sometimes. So Romans 1, 18 through 23 is where we went through last week. And this is just a quick, quick recap before we jump in. And I'm going to read this to you just verse by first verse so you can just um, sit along with it. But this is what we went over last week, these five verses, Romans 1, 18 through 23. The wrath of God, and I want you to pause because that's what we're going to be talking about in a second. I didn't talk about that at all last week. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth, truth suppressors, by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible quality, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse, no excuse. For although they knew God, he's talking about people that are unbelievers, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. They didn't praise him or they didn't thank him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were dark, darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, birds, animals, and reptiles. They worship creation more than they worship the creator. We worship at times creation, people, things, stuff, more than we do the creator. And God says that's foolishness. So I want to circle back a little bit to the beginning statement. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. The wrath of God. And uh, that's where we're going to park for a little while. I want you to think about wrath of God. Your, one of your questions, or at least one of my questions was, was, well, isn't God all loving? So when I say the wrath of God, I say, do those two words Wrath and God go together in the same sentence. We've been in a time period really for a long time in the church, not just this church, but a lot of churches, where we've talked a lot about grace, and we just sang about it, and I cannot over, overstate how important it is. But we've probably done it to the detriment of not talking about wrath, the wrath of God. So when I make a statement about wrath and God, you'd say, well, that's kind of not the God that I know, at least most of you that have come to know Christ at a, at a grace-filled church. And you say, isn't God loving? And I want to make an argument this morning, just a quick argument, that wrath is part of love. And I'm going to try and push it in a way that we can all grasp and then apply that to God. Here's what wrath is. Wrath is extreme anger. So say it with me. Wrath is what? It's extreme anger. So wouldn't you be against wouldn't you have extreme anger or wrath against that which hurts what you love? I mean, wouldn't you be against that which hurts what you love? Mothers against drunk driving. They have wrath against drunk driving, right? Their love for their children has wrath. Their child died because of drunk driving, and they have wrath against drunk driving. That's why there's mothers against drunk drunk driving. Part of their love is wrath against what hurts what they love. Correct? Rape. You have to have, if somebody raped you or you've been raped, and I'm not minimizing anything, I feel your pain, you have wrath against that which hurt what you love. If somebody raped my wife, my daughter, I'd have wrath against that. 
a friend, somebody. You have wrath against that. It's just part of love. When somebody lies and it hurts you or wounds somebody that you love, you have wrath against that because you love them. You have wrath to protect that which is loved by you. God has wrath to protect that which is loved by God. God has wrath against the things that we do, not acknowledging him. It puts us in a bad bind, making excuses. God has wrath, and he pours it out. There's, a, there's an active wrath that we're going to talk about in a little while. You have wrath to protect what you love. So would we all agree that wrath is a part of love? All right, I'll see you later. If you ever had a mom that you can say this, you can mess with mama, but you better not mess with mama's cubs. You can mess with my mom, and my mom says you can mess with her, but you, might, you better not mess with her boys or her daughter, right? And that's for a lot of moms. You say, look, you can say whatever you want to say about me, but you bring it to my daughter's steps, you bring it to my son's steps, and we're going to have some what? Wrath, right? So you understand that. A loving mom is... Uh, and a mom's wrath, by the way, might not always be right. I'm going to throw that in there. But God's wrath is always right. I'm going to throw that in. So it's not that wrath is always right. It's just part of the equation. All right. So now to read Romans 1, 18 again. The wrath of God, which is what we read, is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth. The wrath of God is being brought against people who deny God who reject God, who turn away from God, the unbelievers of God. God says there will be a wrath that will come on that. And then he goes on in Romans 1.23 at the very end. And they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being. The wrath of God will go on the people in that lie, that try and pull people away from God. So the wrath of God will be on people who exchange the truth for a lie. With me on that? All right. So I wrote it this way just a little bit. They exchange, and this is on your sheets of paper, but they exchange meology over theology. In other words, what I believe about life is greater than uh, what the nature of God teaches us. That's meology over theology. There's a lot of friends that you have. They're nice people. They're great people, but they have a meology, and it's about them and what they believe. Well, I believe God wouldn't do this. Well, I don't like that. I don't agree with that. They exchange the truth of God for a lie. And their meology at times could mirror what God says, but most often their meology goes against the theology of God. That's number one. The second thing is they take personal preference over biblical or godly principle. So what I believe about something, what my preference is, is greater than what God says. That's, what I, that's the exchange of truth for life. They take what I think over what God says. Well, this is what I think about this. But God says this, well, this is what I think about it. This is what I'm going to take. All right. So if we jump ahead a little bit, and we get to the end of Scripture, we'd read a book called Revelation. And uh, we get a little hint of what happens to those who reject the truth of God and replace themselves with an idol of themselves, somebody else, something, but they exchange the truth for a lie. Revelation 14, 10 says this, and they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the lamb. In other words, this sounds like a harsh thing about God, but God says there is a punishment, there is a a price to pay. A drunk driving, there's a price to pay. You rape somebody, there's a price to be paid. You hurt somebody, there's a price to be paid. God says, there is a wrath to be poured because you've hurt that which I love. You've denied me, you've rejected me, you've hurt other people, you've walked away from me. There's a wrath that goes along with that. Hard to hear. I'm getting that. I'm going to give you a pause in a second. There will be torment with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. I'm not totally can tell you what that means or how bad that is. All I can tell you is it's not a place that we want to be, okay? That's why you're here. That's why maybe somebody brought you here is to think about this. You've got to make your own decision. I'm all for that, but I think it should be an informed decision. All right. Well, you say, well, how bad is that cup? That cup of wrath that God says that they drink about, this cup of wrath that Romans that Paul talked about alluded to. 
in Romans. How bad is it? Jesus, before he was crucified, went into a garden, and he prayed, and he's going to pray all night, and he brought some of his friends with him, some of the ones that followed him. And it says he prayed so severely that he had droplets of blood come out of his eyes, and that it was a bad, heavy thing, one of those things, oh, no, I don't, I don't want this. Imagine that you know that somebody's going to die, and you just pray, and you're praying, that I don't want this to happen. I don't know the age of the person, but you know how, how you just... You're just pouring yourself out. I, can you help with this? Can you stop this? Well, what Jesus was praying about was, was for all of us, for all humanity, Jesus was going to drink the cup of our wrath. See, when he was crucified, he's gone three days. He said, what happened? Well, I personally believe the wrath of God, of all sin, of all mankind, was being poured on Jesus. My sin. Every thought, that I haven't held captive to goodness, every deed that I've done to hurt people, every time I've rejected God and made me the idol, this wrath was poured on God. Luke twenty two forty two. Here's what Jesus says. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. He prayed it three times. If you're willing, take this cup from me, this cup of wrath. I don't think it was the crucifixion that he was praying about. I think it was the cup of wrath that he didn't, he didn't want this separation from God. Now, praise God, we know that he rose victorious over that, taking our sin and our wrath. Paul also mentions this wrath later on in Romans 2.5, which we won't be to for about three weeks. Romans 2.5, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Now, I want you to think about that. So we're under the wrath of God because of our behavior with one another and with primarily with God. I don't care what age you are, 15 or 85. And the sad thing is, here's the point I'm trying to, we can deny it, but I just don't believe it changes the truth. My children are under God's wrath. My grandchildren are going to be under God's wrath, whether they ever admit it or not. Either you get the wrath, or Jesus gets the wrath for you. That's why we're here. That's the church. That's the message that Jesus came to bring and to live and to put in our hands and to share with people. Either you get the wrath, all of us are going to be under the condemnation of that wrath, or either Jesus gets it, and therefore there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So hopefully when you take communion, you can understand more what would happen. It wasn't just his body It was the wrath of God that was poured on him, undeservedly. That's called active wrath. And someday you'll sidestep that if you've trusted Christ, but he took it for you. It didn't go away. Well, another kind of wrath uh, from God that we can talk about is called passive wrath of God. It's the passive wrath. It's not active where something's poured down on you, but it's passive in this point of view. Scripture would point to it, and we'll talk to it in a second. He hands you over or kind of lets you completely go. In other words, there's some things you think about doing. Hurting yourself, hurting someone else, doing something physically, sexually, emotionally, and something holds you back. You don't. You have this thought and you don't. And I believe that that's God interceding for for all of us. Saying, okay, I'm, I'm kind of helping you right now with this. But then there's a time, which is called passive wrath, where God just kind of goes, you're on your own. You've rejected me so many times. You've done this so many times. You've ingrained this in your mind so much that I'm just going to let you go and let it go where it goes. An example of that would be Jesus with Judas. He's at the Last Supper, I think, Jesus knew exactly what Judas was going to do. He says, go do what you think you're going to do. Go ahead. Go do it. Judas went. He betrays Jesus. And he ends up hanging himself. I think that's the passive wrath of Jesus, allowing Judas to go. Go. That's what he did. The prodigal son. And this is good news and bad news, by the way. We know the story of the prodigal son. Prodigal just meant uh, kind of 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 the world. This prodigal son story is that Jesus gives this parable 
and it's a story with meaning. And the story is about the son who wants his inheritance from his father, and normally he only got the inheritance when his father was dead. So he said, God, he said, Dad, I want my inheritance now, and I want to spend it now. In other words, Dad, I don't care if you're dead. I want it right now. Imagine if you got a parent, and you're going to be left in the will, and they're kind of old right now. And you went up to him and says, I kind of wish you were dead now because I want your house. I want to sell it. Now, if any of you have thought that, a lot of us have thought that. If any of you have thought that, then the question is, that's not good, right? right. So what keeps you from, well, Jesus gives this story and says, this is what this kid did. He just didn't think it. He did it. And Jesus says, the story is this. The story really isn't about the prodigal son. The story really is about the Father, and the Father represents God. Jesus is trying to reveal to us a bit about who God is. And so he makes this story, and he says, here's the deal. He comes to his father, and he says, I want my inheritance now. And the father says, okay, fine, go take it. And the kid goes off, and he has wild living, it says. Later on, we find out that he's been with prostitutes and so forth. So total wine women song, the total, you know, just did everything he wanted to do. But here's the key that you got to get. Jesus, in the story, when the prodigal says, I want to go, and here's what I want to go do, Jesus didn't stop him. He could have wrote the story. Well, the prodigal son wanted to do this, and the father said, no, don't go, stay here. I won't let you go. Instead, because of passive wrath, Jesus says, the father said, fine, go do what you want to do. Go do it. And he let him go. And he got so low that he wanted to eat the food that the pigs were eating. This is a Jew talking about wanting to do that. He got so bad. So then he came to his senses, it says, and he wanted to go back. This is the good news. When he came back, God didn't chase him. But when he came back, God opened his hands wide open, went and kissed him, grabbed him by his neck and hugged him and said, welcome back. My son was lost and now he's found. He was dead and now he's alive again. Thank you for coming back. That's the good news. But passive wrath is not good news. All right, everybody take a deep breath. There's active wrath and there's passive wrath. And God uses both on those he loves. Okay, that's a true statement. Not, this message isn't to beat us up. I want you to hear me because we're going to turn a corner here. It's not going to feel like it, but we are turning a corner. It's not to beat us up. This message is to build us up. It's to give us an anchor of truth, to soberly, Clearly minded, think about our lives to understand the urgency of the gospel message of Jesus for our children and our children's children. Okay? It's not to, it, again, this is not to beat us up. It's to grow us up in truth and to grow us up and understand the grace of God more. It's to knock some blinders off and to put on some of the protectors of God. That's really what it's for. Did you know we serve a holy God? Did you know the writers in, in, in the uh, scriptures, the Bible, 66 books, the mind to make the Bible, do you know they mentioned the holiness of God 600 times? Holiness is who God is. Scripture helps us become more holy or understand the holiness of God so we can understand the grace of God. I wrote this. The Bible is not an old book. It's an eternal book. And because it's timeless, it's timely. The Bible's not an old book. It's an eternal book. It's forever. And because it's timeless, it makes it timely right now. That's why what was written 2,000 years ago, you read it and you go, well, you're describing our time period right now. I know. Isn't it amazing that the Bible's a timeless book that's timely now? It's an eternal book. That's how God wrote it. There's no question about it. All right. So that's why we're jumping into this Romans. That's why I'm encouraging you to stay through it. That's why I'm encouraging you to invite your friends. They may hate Jesus. They may hate God, not like any of this. If they come here, it at least will, will help them make a clearer choice. That's what I would say. And this is a welcome place for people like that. If you're like that, this was designed for you to come and hear. There was a time where I said, I don't know who God is. I don't even know if I believe there's a God. But I tell you what, I'm glad I was able to go to a place that could show me some truth and make me think about it, or at least what they thought was truth and make me think about it. Romans 12, 2. Later on in the book of Romans, this is uh, eight weeks before we get here. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
In other words, learn about Scripture. That's what renews your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You'll know this is what I should do. This is what I shouldn't do. This is what would honor God. This is what would dishonor God. You may still do what dishonors God, but at least you know. At least you're aware of it. All right. That's the recap of where we've been for two weeks, if you can believe it. Romans, I think, has got 16 chapters. This is my third week, and we're not, we're not done with chapter one. We might be doing this into 2022. I'm not sure. I know, I, I, I know I'm going to have to cut this short. I already know it because I'm looking at the clock. I've got 50 more minutes of a message, and I've got 18 minutes to give it. So I will end up cutting what I'm going to say today, and you're going to have to come back for part two of today's message next week. And All right, sorry. I'm going to try and move into the final eight verses of chapter one. I'm not going to get all eight. I already know that now. Wow, so much in Romans. We've just been in the introduction, isn't it? He talks about the wrath of God. He talks about excuses. He talks about acknowledging God. And this is just the introduction. Before I go into these last ones, here's what I've got to caution you. And now I'm going to really look at people that are Christ followers. I'm going to speak to the people that are Christ followers that know this world is really broken when you compare it to what God's standard is. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to look at these verses in a binocular, in a binocular, like you're looking at someone else. I'm, not ask, I'm asking you not to do that, is what I'm saying. Don't look at it like you're... I'm asking you to look at these verses like in a mirror where it's back at you. Get what I'm saying? So in other words, I could read these verses, and you could be looking at everybody else and thinking, yeah, that guy, that guy, that guy, that TV show, that, that, that uh, political party, that person... I'm asking you not to look at these lenses for the next two weeks with binoculars, but with a mirror back at you. I believe that would honor God and honor Paul as he wrote this. If you remember in verse 23, it ended with they worshiped themselves and not God. That's what I read at the very beginning. That's where we ended. Now we're picking up verse 24, okay? They worshiped themselves and not God. 23, verse 24, Romans 1, 24. Therefore, because they did that, God gave them over. He gave them over. He said, fine, Judas, fine. You're going to do that? Fine. He gave them over. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things, their body, sex, rather than the creator who has forever praised amen. This is what Paul's saying is what's happened. He's speaking to the church in Rome. There's Jewish people that have tried to follow the letter of the law, and a lot of them have been hypocritical. And then there's these Greek Christians that just anything goes was what, what was in their world. We'll talk about Greek, Roman culture in a couple weeks to understand how he's talking this. But that culture, the Greco-Roman culture, basically mirrors where we're at right now in the United States. 2,000 years later, it really almost mirrors it. So he gave them over. He, this is passive wrath. He says, God, because they did not worship, they worshiped themselves and not God, they honored themselves and not God, he gave them over. Just to hit this one more time. Any of you guys, raise your hand in here, and if you're online, you can raise your hand at home. If you're in here, raise your hand if you've ever had, if you've ever had the pleasure to raise a teenager. Raise your hand. Okay. A lot of you have. Some of you that are teenagers right now, we will enjoy it when you have to raise your teenager, just so you know that. But there comes a point where a teenager says, you know what, I'll, you can tell me what to do right now. You can take away my phone. You take away the car. I'm under your authority. But there comes a time period where I'm going to do what I'm going to want to do. And I've seen some parents, rightfully or wrongly, that eventually just go, fine. You do what you want to do knowing that there's a brick wall that they're running into, knowing there's a ditch that they're driving into, knowing that there's a grave that they may be opening because of what, how they're going to live. But you've said, I just had enough. And it's passive wrath. It's hoping that the consequences change the behavior. You can understand that. That's where God's at here. It's not unloving. He says, therefore, God gave them over. Fine, this is what you want. This is where Okay, I'm not going to restrain you at all. I'm not going to put the Holy Spirit, a conscious, whatever you want. I'm, you do what you do. And it says they, they had the sinful desires of the heart. They, it went to sexual impurity. 
That's where it went. Sex is good. But sex is a very bad God. Sex created by God is good. But sex is a bad God. To worship it, to define yourself by a sex act is a very, very bad God. It does not work. Sex is like a fire. I want to imagine, how many of you guys love a warm fire? It's 10 degrees outside. You have the pleasure to go home to a fireplace or you're outside and you're around a fire pit. Sex, a fire is phenomenal. Amen? Amen? Except that same fire that works in the pit, when it's taken outside of the pit, it burns a house down. My legs have third-degree burns on them from when I was a little baby. They're about a year old and uh, up to my knees. They're badly scarred. Um, and what happened was the house we were moving into caught on fire. I was in the garage. The garage blew up. That same fire that warms the house, the heater, got out of there, and it almost killed me. Okay? Sex is like that. In the fireplace, it's what? It's good stuff. Outside of the fireplace, it can burn your life down. We can be identified by God. We're his treasured children. We're his forgiven children. We're sinners saved by the grace of God. We can be identified by God. Or we can be identified by sex. That's really where the world's at right now. So I just gave you a list on your sheets. You've got them at home in the, in the notes section. You can look online. And it says, what are the forbidden sex acts, sexual acts in the Bible? Why would God say that sex is dangerous? It's like fire. In the, in the right format, the right place where God wrote it, it's great. Outside of that, it just burns down life after life after life. So I'm going to go through these just really quick because I've only got seven more minutes. So I'm going to hit these really fast. All right? And by the way, before I forget this, you know where I said, therefore God gave them over? The last three verses of what we're going to talk about starts off with, therefore God gave them over. A few sentences, we're going to get these next two next week. Therefore God gave them over. Therefore God gave them over. What he gave them over to is what we're going to look at. And how does that impact us? So I'm only going to get to one of them. Now, I'd hope to get to all three today, but I'm not. So you have to come back for the other two to finish off Romans chapter 1 before we leap into Romans chapter 2. What are the forbidden sexual acts? That's fornication. That's basically sex outside of the confines of marriage. One man, one woman, four life together. That's basically what it is. I'm a fornicator. My wife and I, Kathy, had sex before we were married. I say it not proudly at all. I say it regretfully, actually. We're fornicators. Most of you are probably fornicators. Some of you right now might be living in fornication. It's a dangerous place to be. I understand the parts of it, but I'm just telling you that it's a tough place to be. Adultery, that's another one. I don't need any explanation on that, what that is. Sex outside of marriage. You're married, you have sex with somebody else. Polygamy, that's the next big one that's going to hit, by the way. This is my prediction. Stone me if I'm wrong. Right now, you know what we're talking about? It's going to be polygamy. There's be, in the, with the argument of the world today, there'd be no reason that multiple people shouldn't be under the quote-unquote protection of marriage. You're going to see more polyamory, polygamy, this type of thing. That's forbidden by God. Rape, another sex thing. It's forbidden by God. Incest, sex with relatives, forbidden by God. Homosexuality, which we're going to really push on really hard next week, is forbidden by God. You can read it. Bestiality, sex with animals, forbidden by God. Prostitution, forbidden by God. Sexual immorality, and the Greek term for that is pornography, forbidden by God. If you're going home and you're watching your computer, you're doing something that's forbidden by God. It's not good. It's outside of the fireplace. Pagan sexual activity, you're worshiping God through sex. At this time period, they had uh, temple prostitutes. You went to the temple... And you had sex, and that, they said that honored their God that they worshiped. I bet attendance was pretty good by the guys. Normally in the church, it's down. Remember, this is a mirror, not binoculars. I'm not looking at that person or that person. I'm looking at me. Which of these do I struggle with? I'll say this. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not going to say it. All right. Say it next week. So you'd say, 
Well, time, times have changed. We've evolved. God doesn't know the modern man, modern woman today. It doesn't hurt anyone what I do with my own sex life. It doesn't hurt. I don't have to do what God says. The CDC said that yearly in the United States, there's now 20 million new STD infections each year. 20 million. I'd say a substantial number of us in this room or watching online probably have it. With half among young people ages 15 to 24, the cost of STDs to the U.S. healthcare system annually is over $16 billion. It's not to make you feel bad. This is to make you understand how much God loves us and how good he is and how truthful he is. And for some of you, it's to keep people from doing, to encourage them to do, to follow God, because you didn't. That's sometimes in my case. In the United States, this is an estimate, pretty accurate, there's over 700,000 abortions yearly. The vast majority of them being 16 weeks and earlier. A baby's heart start beating, starts beating in the third week. We clinically call somebody dead when their heart stops. Should we call somebody alive when their heart begins? This is not binoculars. This is mirrors. 25% of all women, all women in the United States have been sexually assaulted. And many estimates bring that up to 50% because it's unreported. 25%. No question. My daughter has a 25% chance of being sexually assaulted. My granddaughter, my little precious Lola. Sex trafficking for children worldwide is that 1.2 million children are trafficked annually, with over 300,000 of them in the United States alone. 40% of all births will be to unmarried people. Amongst the African-Americans, it's 70%. The fire is raging out of the fireplace, doing heavy damage in life after life after life. It does not have to be that way, beloved of God. It does not have to be. And for those of you that say, well, I'm on that list, which is all of us somewhere, there's a God who loves you, and there's a wrath stored up for this behavior that's hurt people and others. And the way you escape it is by having that wrath put on Jesus as you trust in him. See, I don't believe God is being repressive when he gives us a standard that is high, a man and a woman under the confines of marriage for life. I believe he's being protective. That's the fireplace. That's the beauty. And even then has some brokenness to it because of our thought life, right? Right? But that's the best standard. You would want that. That's the thought. And I know some of us are in hard positions. And I'm going to talk about those next week. I'm very sympathetic towards those that find ourselves on the list. I get it. And we're going to talk about it a lot. I want to throw this in. Hollywood is more about perversity than diversity. Can I just say that to you? Just go through your Showtime movie channels at night or HBO, or HBO Max. It's, Hollywood doesn't push, it's not diversity, it's perversity they push. You will very rarely ever find marriage lifted up between a man and a woman and sex within that as a gift from God. You will very rarely see that as sex. It'll be everything but that in Hollywood. And that's the manure that our children are getting shoved down their throat, that you're getting shoved down your throat as well that I think makes God want to vomit. Am I right? Amen, am I right? And I don't mean right, I'm just saying that's an observation. Any person can make this observation. You may not be on the God side, I get that, but at least make the observation that from the God side, this is kind of what we're at right now. Right? That's it. And Christians are intermingling with this. We're, we're, we're in that, it's either... It's either the war from the world or the war from the word. That's the battle that's going on. Are you going to believe God and trust God for what he's done? Or are you going to trust the world for where it's at? And I'm just saying, the fire out of the pit ain't so good. The stats I gave you aren't from the Bible. They're from everything you can find that's, that tracks this stuff. 
Why is it that way? Why, if God's rules are so rigid and are so wrong, then why does all this stuff happen to you? Why, if you've violated this, why is your mind so hurt by sexual impurity? Why do you carry these wounds with you so long? All right. So here's a question as I round up and get right in this. I know there's a lot of us in this room, and certainly young people, you don't want to hear this. I wouldn't want to hear at the young age that it was with my wife, Kathy. We dated since we were freshmen. You can figure out when we started having sex. I'm not going to tell you. It's a tough thing. The Bible talks about clean youthful lust. I will admit you, I'm 61, be 62 soon. I don't struggle with a lot of those lusts that I know you do as 15. I got it. But I know the damage I did when I was that age. And we were lucky. We escaped some major complications. God loves you so much. So much more than your mom or dad sitting to your left or right. He says, gosh, there's, there's just a way and understand there's a wrath. It's, it's, it's a passive wrath. I don't, you don't want to be at the point where he just lets you go. Can we at least admit this? Acknowledge that God is the sexuality expert and we're not. Can you just at least go that far to say, you know what, it, it seems wrong and, and I know I'd have to say no to a lot of things, and, but I tell you what, I, I don't think there's many people that would tell you that have gone not the way of God that would tell you that it was a good thing. And we're going to try this next week. It's so PG-13, if not R. I mean, you've got to just be real careful who you bring in. There's two more God gave them overs next week. We'll finish next week. I'm just running out of time. As I close, I want to say this. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm going to say it again. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God at work in our lives that brings salvation unto us. I'm not ashamed of the good news of Jesus. I'm not ashamed to say what God says about how we should live. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of that. Who said that? We talked about this in week one. Paul, that's how he starts this letter. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of God. It is the most loving thing I can tell you if you're 15 or 18 or 21 or 25 or 85 or 75 or 50. If you've let a life lived marred by sin. I'm not ashamed of the gospel to tell you God loves you and is aware of everything you've done. In fact, he's aware of more that you've done. Something that you thought wasn't a sin, God knew it was. And he still loves you and he still sent Jesus for you. That kind of love is unheard of other than through God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Oak Bridge is not ashamed of the gospel. We never have been. It's a church that for 17 years has been built on the gospel. It's what we tell our students in the edge. It's what we tell our children everywhere. We're not ashamed of the gospel. And you shouldn't either. And right about now when I'm saying I'm not ashamed about the gospel, you guys should say a rousing amen. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It should be an amen. You shouldn't be ashamed of it. When somebody says, you're a repressive Christian, my answer is, no, I'm not. I want you to have the maximum freedom that you can have in this world, and it can only be found through the love and guidance of God. That's what I want. Otherwise, you're going to back yourself into a corner. You're going to define yourself by some sexual term when God says, you're my beloved, you're my treasured child. You're going to settle for a lot less than a lot more. And then even bigger, I don't want to miss this. I want you to walk into heaven. My mom and dad trusted Jesus Christ with their life. Their wrath was put on Jesus. I want to see my mom and my dad again. I got a sister who I never saw. She's younger than I am. Her name's Jody Lynn. My mom had, 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 had her as a baby. She was born. They knocked my mom out after the birth. For three days, she was basically unconscious out of it. Jody Lynn was born and died at birth. She had major birth defects. I want to see Jody Lynn again. I want to see her for the first time with no broken body. She was formed before she was in her mother's womb. God knew her. I want to see her. Because of Jesus Christ, I can have that. That will all be restored and made right with God in heaven, outside of God, away from God. I don't think it's ever made right. I think it's worse. There's a hope that we have in heaven that is so good. 
One eye on heaven, one eye on this earth, and truth. And God loves you. Not to condemn you. For God so gave his son, because he loves you. Not to condemn you, but to save you. There's a closing song we're going to sing. as The band gets ready to come up. And there's a line in it that I love, and it's a song called Living Hope. And it says, Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. If you know him, then you need to sing this in full voice. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. When I take my last breath on this earth, when my heart stops beating, it starts again with God anew. You have broken every chain. Those things that can haunt you and hound you can be broken. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Amen. Romans 3, part 2 of the end of Romans chapter 1, next week. God, we love you. And we praise you and we thank you. This, this book, God, that you've left for us called Romans, that you had Paul pen, is so deep. Some of us, it touches so deeply into our soul. May we learn to own this to bring praise to you as we do, to understand who we are and how much we're loved, but how far, how far short of you we fall. Thank you, God, for this living hope that tomorrow we can make better decisions than today, that our past doesn't have to determine our future because of what you've done and who you are. You tell us you can make us new. Dear Father, I pray for young people. This is what I'm really praying for, that they get this right early because so many people my age did not I pray, dear God, that your passive wrath is not poured out on a generation. Dear God, we pray for you to hold it back. Touch them, convict them, guide them, encourage them, rebuke them. God, we love you. We pray for our community, we pray for our families, we pray for our country. We pray for our world. God, you are a living hope. We praise you. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ who took our wrath as we trust in that. God, we love you. It's in his name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing to our King.
promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise you As we close to let you guys out of here, I want you to look at somebody next to them and say, you're not as good morally as you think you are. Say that. <laughs> and then look at them right now and say, but I can tell you this, God loves you a lot more than you think he does. Say that. All right, next week, part two, you've got fair warning. If you come next week, you can throw stones at me. You can, not going to make a difference. I'm going to preach what I'm going to preach. So be ready for it. If you want to invite somebody, that's great. If you're our guest today, come to the Information Center. Grab one of these. There's a coupon in there for a free drink at the cafe and a free T-shirt that they'll go you to. Everybody okay? See you guys next week. Thanks for coming.